Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this presentation, given as part of the Anarchism Research Group seminar series, Peterson Silver talks about how the concept of freedom has been used in anarchist political theory. Don't forget to click subscribe and like and share this video. Hello everyone, uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, good morning for those watching from Brazil, good afternoon for those watching from the UK. Uh, my name is Peterson Silva and I am a PhD student from UFSC Brazil. And uh, my research, funded by Brazilian agencies CAPES and CNPQ, is about freedom and anarchism, and uh, that is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, since this is an ARG seminar, uh, of course, we're going to have a discussion after the main talk. But since this is being done on Facebook, unfortunately, this will have to be done through written comments. So I do encourage you to write comments with questions or considerations, and I'll try to respond as best I can. Uh, please bear in mind this is an ongoing research, so I very much look forward to your input. Uh, more perspectives are always welcome. And um, I am aware this is a very theory-driven presentation, and though I try to keep it down to earth as much as possible, there are too many things to go through, as I also try to keep it under 20 minutes, so it's hard. I uh, left a lot of detail out, and um, anyway, if you'd like me to talk more about something, uh, maybe with more examples or something, leave a comment. I'd love to do that later on. Also, uh, finally, feel free to write your comments in Portuguese or Spanish, but uh, please make sure your comment is brief so that I can translate it and get everyone on the same page. And also bear in mind that I'll have to respond in English, right? So, uh, having said that, uh, I guess we can begin. Um, Micah said, what about Zoom? Yeah, Zoom has a few limitations, uh, especially the 40-minute uh, limit for free accounts. So... Uh, there's that. Uh, anyway, we've, we've already tested the connection and everything. Facebook seems a little bit more stable at the moment, so um, that's what we're going to use, I think. But uh, I think, let's see if we can make this work with uh, written comments, right? Okay, so uh, let's begin. Well, when I first came to study freedom, uh, I felt that anarchism didn't really fit with any of the more widespread definitions in academia and that uh, this was an under-theorized subject within anarchist studies. So I think that understanding how anarchists define freedom might shed some light on issues that are currently being overlooked or help come up with new ways of thinking about old problems, right? So what I imagined I would find is something similar to what you've already got with other ideologies. So is a core concept shared by most, if not all, anarchists with some disagreements on the fringes, so fault lines and subdivisions, which are, of course, not that hard to predict. Uh, however, the more I read, the more I realized how rarely did anarchists actually define freedom, especially outside of a framework derived of other traditions of thought. Let me tell you about Alan Ritter's book, Anarchism, published 40 years ago. Uh, his intention was to read Godwin, Proudhon, uh, Bakunin and Kropotkin, and then summarize the theoretical core, so to speak, of anarchism. Uh, and he concluded that what anarchists really value is not freedom, but something he called communal individuality. And he then argued that freedom was at best a necessary step to get to that, but that it wasn't an end in itself. So, Ritter's analysis has quite a few problems, but I'll focus on one at the moment. He already had a concept of freedom going into the analysis, right? He understood freedom as the absence of restraint, and then he assumed anarchists also did, because that's what freedom is, right? Uh, now, the thing is, although Ritter's attempt was defective by design, I reckon he was hardly at fault for assuming a liberal view of freedom in this case, because anarchists themselves tended to use words like freedom and free and liberty, um in the same liberal sense than he assumed, right? That he assumed, sorry. Uh, so I concluded that this is because most anarchists were concerned with being read by a wider public, and this approachability quickly becomes a liability. So let me explain. Uh, anarchists are very rarely analytical about freedom, so they rarely begin a text by saying that the readers don't know what freedom is, they're wrong, right? They're, they're, they've been misled, and they're going to enlighten the readers of the correct concept, right? So, anarchists generally use the usual meaning of freedom at first to engage in a dialogue and lead the audience to unusual conclusions. 
So they don't want to give the impression that people need a glossary to talk to them. Um, but the thing is, when you do that, you create a sort of tension between the basic concept and these conclusions. So either you can draw the conclusions from your concept or you can't. And if you can't, you have a problem, right? So we're going to see the consequences of that soon enough. Um, but in general, the thing is that when you play with somebody else's rules, you are bound to lose to them. Um, at any rate, uh, literal or linguistic approaches miss the substance for the format in that case. So what I'm trying to do is reverse engineer a concept of freedom from anarchist literature. So concepts of freedom, they are very closely related to ideas of human nature and desirable society. So your picture of what society should look like, of how human beings do, could and should relate to one another, already encapsulate an idea of freedom, even if you don't spell it out directly. So I'm looking for a way to describe this idea, or at least a version of it, that would be agreeable to anarchists, coherent with the vision of society they work towards even though they themselves might not have used that concept explicitly in their texts. So this approach comes with its own dangers, I'm aware, and uh, it might be the case that the fault lines I already expected to find in the first place make this impossible. But so far I don't think that's the case. In fact, I've identified three components of such a concept of freedom, uh, two that are common and one that explains some of the internal divisions and debates of anarchism to a certain extent. So I'm going to begin with restriction, or the lack thereof. Uh, Non-restriction, or lack of restriction, or maybe unrestriction, is arguably the most common sense definition of freedom nowadays. So, on the one hand, people usually talk about being unfree when they are restricted somehow, especially physically, but even in the sense of being free as developing your full potential, or uh, acting according to reason instead of instincts, there still lingers an idea that actions are unfree if they're based on irrational desires, that being free means uh, controlling your desires so that you're not restricted by them when you act. Now, as I understand it, the general direction of anarchist critique is not only that someone can be restricted but free, but that someone can be unrestricted but unfree. So, we basically detach the idea of freedom from that of unrestriction. Not completely, of course, but meaningfully. Anarchist criticism of the state is usually coupled with an endorsement of other forms of social organization, for example, federations of directly democratic communes. So, rules are not, by definition, the antithesis of freedom. Matthew Wilson has an interesting book called Rules Without Rulers, and that, I think that's a beautiful summary of anarchist sociability. Now, let us turn to the other point many anarchists have made as they oppose not only capitalism, but also patriarchy, white supremacy, priestly bigotry, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can be unrestricted and still be unfree. How so? Well, the thing is, desire shouldn't be taken at face value. So, if you are unrestricted to do something you want, it could be that there's something that you want emerged out of a context of domination. And so, what you want is precisely to continue to be dominated. So, if subjugated people may come to want their oppression, we lose the ability to characterize such a situation as unfree if we turn freedom into a subjective property or a matter of doing whatever you want. So, it should be noted, of course, that violence, restriction, if you will, is always historically, at least, at the root of the social conditions that produce these warped desires. But like John P. Clarke remarks, uh, a society committed to minimizing overt coercion or its threat can quite freely conform to a non-pluralistic system of values, considering that rewards, for example, are not coercive. So, how do we talk about the racial or gender wage gap if they can't be traced to specific coercive actors, being rather a consequence of major social dynamics of unrestricted choice? So, an example from Brazil as well. So, several weeks ago, workers in the oil industry were striking, and one of the things that the company tried to do was paying workers to scab, to break the strike. So workers were striking, by the way, not only for better con work conditions, but due to the laying off en masse of a portion of them. So is it possible to understand that in terms of unfreedom, right, in a paradigm that sees freedom as lack of restriction, just, you know, you're not being 
uh, prohibited from doing something. Well, maybe. Is there a liberal rhetorical trap in there somewhere? You bet there is. So it seems to me that when anarchists write about freedom, they depart from a different basic foundation altogether, instead of an restriction. I think it could be described as latitude for non-conformity, meaning how easy it is to reject current social restrictions, that is, rules. So let me describe it a little. Uh, it is not a feature of a person or a group, but rather of the relationship between the people and groups considered. It is quantitative, even if not quantifiable exactly, and even as you find some freedom uh, thus defined in a network of relationships, you might find different levels of it as you zoom out to include more relations or zoom in to focus on specific ones. Something which does not necessarily negate the freedom you'd found before, though it could certainly limit it. Finally, all make it harder to non-conform, uh, others make it easier. So the point here is not that restrictions are unproblematic, but that the presence and quantity of restrictions, rules, structures, etc. are not the basic element of analysis. But to fully see what that amounts to, uh, we need to consider two other components of freedom. So let's talk about equality first, right? the other common theme. Uh, anarchists have always insisted on the connection between equality and freedom, but the precise connection between one and the other is rarely explained. Take, for example, Bakunin's famous formulation on freedom. I'm sorry if you've heard this a thousand times before, but here it goes. I am truly free, I quote, right? I am truly free only when all human beings, men and women, are equally free. The freedom of other men, far from negating or limiting my freedom, is, on the contrary, its necessary premise and confirmation. My personal freedom, confirmed by the liberty of all, extends to infinity. Okay, so freedom is not freedom unless it is equal. But why, though? So, if you see that some people have more freedom than others, uh, you could say that this is not fair, but to say that it is not freedom at all is something else entirely. So, when Bakunin says that the freedom of other people does not limit or negate my own, what are you talking about? If I am free to imprison you, how come my freedom does not limit yours? And if everyone must have equal freedom, you are going to have to devise systems of distribution, so to speak, to guarantee this equal distribution of freedom. Practice means rules, so that people do not exploit each other, which would in fact limit everyone's freedom to a certain degree. And lo and behold, we are back into the Hobbesian or, Locke or Lockean world of the social contract, aren't we? So. In connecting equality to freedom, some things must be made clearer. Anarchists usually have to explain, for instance, that equality is not sameness. But on the other hand, what is it about then? Equality is sameness of something, just not everything. So what is it that we need to minimally be equal on or that we're actively trying to equalize? How does that square, for instance, with the intersectionality of oppressions? The thing is that anarchists generally criticize equality when it is used to shut conversations down instead of developing them, as an argument for saying that people have to conform to how things are instead of looking for alternatives. So even well-meaning systems of distribution that attempt to equalize people according to certain criteria might then be used as proof that equality was already achieved, and therefore anyone complaining wants privileges. So I don't think I need to give examples of such arguments, they're everywhere. So when equality is a premise rather than a specific circumstance, it is making it easier for people to non-conform since people have more opportunities to denounce unjust situations and demand for social changes. Okay, um, however, this could imply a hands-off approach that offloads all the responsibility into personal morality. And I don't think that's the point here. People must want equality and fight for it, that would be good, sure, but equality is the way people regularly relate to one another. I'm talking about agreements, rules, institutions. That is needed because inequality tends to reproduce and grow, just like free markets tend to develop monopolies. Like we discussed before, this is about being unrestricted and still unfree. So I'm going to return to this again soon because it is crucial, but at any rate, equality has to materialize into rules 
practices and institutions that restrict us into the inability to dominate. Non-domination, in this case, is a key concept that goes back to some of the first classical texts of anarchism and might be a better way to conceive of the equality that anarchists value without the linguistic traps of the word. On the other hand, it's not at all about, uh, or I mean, it's not all about uh, the things you don't do, like not dominate. Anarchist literature is a constant accusation of laws being good for nothing, of rights not being respected. So, equality is made manifest in relations only when people enact it. They depend on practices that make it a fact, not only an ideal. Okay, uh, let's talk about the third component, which you could call a specific sociology of anarchism. In admittedly very generic lines, anarchists either aim for harmony between individuals and their communities, or, which is arguably a minority position, harmony between sovereign individuals. Now, this harmony is best understood as the outcome of conflicts, right? As spontaneous, meaning not imposed, arrangements that satisfy conflicting demands. So, it doesn't come naturally and in situations of domination, not even easily or peacefully. So, sociologically, there's a common position there. Uh, the mediation of these conflicts in order to get to harmony should not come in the form of minority-run centralized violence. In fact, that, that is seen as a source of many more problems. However, beneath these goals and perspectives, there lingers an unquestioned theoretical dichotomy between the individual and society. I mean, even if you want them to harmonize, the fact that you want that means that you see them as distinct entities to begin with. To be clear, no one can deny the existence of individual physical bodies with independent cognitive apparatus, but I'm talking here about the idea of the rational self, detachable from its relationships and collective identities. Now, the problem of having this notion of the individual in your vocabulary is that if you refuse to defend its primacy, you can get accused of falling into the totalitarian slope. So, if society naturally shapes individuals, does this shaping never become an oppression? But on the other hand, if you do defend its primacy, you can get rhetorically twisted into defending domination. I mean, those within anarchism who defend individual sovereignty above all else very often align with enthusiasts of the free market whose desired social arrangements entail hierarchy and violence. So it seems to me that the language of individuals is an Eurocentric legacy that need not and should not be the basis for an anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist political philosophy. The colonial enterprise in the United States, for example, has enormously influenced the prevalence of individualist anarchism there. Jason Adams uh, says that Bakunin's ideas were already seen by Marx as Eastern oddities, right? Bakunin was Russian. Um, also, the experience of the Zapatistas and the Kurds in Rojava shows us what happens when anarchism, albeit indirectly, meets other kinds of philosophies, right? So, collective efforts and rules to ensure that social arrangements are flexible and changeable are all there, and yet individuals don't feel particularly oppressed by their own societies. In fact, they experience oppression in their relations with neighboring states. So, Productive critiques of the rational self can be found within Western thought. I mean, Foucault already, Foucault already said the individual is a modern invention, and I'm not even sure he was the first one to say that. But a particularly promising non-Western outlook can be found in the work of Marilyn Strathern and other anthropologists who talk about the transpersonal self. That is, an understanding that we are, as humans, prone to relating to others in such a way that we come to understand these others as part of ourselves, as literally part of ourselves. So we begin to understand people by understanding their relations. We begin with sociability as an open-ended process through which individual bodies seek not only food and shelter, but appreciation, respect, an opportunity to exercise their abilities, value. And although in this process we remain separate bodies, our subjectivities are constituted by much more than what our bodies demand. So, understanding individual bodies and collective identities as part of a single process of sociability can accommodate for anarchist conclusions even when these were reached through the language of the individual society dichotomy. And it's important because it reframes the questions we ask. 
It's not about whether individuals are able to do whatever they want or to non-conform to society, but whether current relations and arrangements are set up in such a way that identities, individual bodies, yes, but also groups, are having their demands met. So when someone feels that they can only be free or happy by being an individual against society, something is wrong from an anarchist point of view with the arrangements. And the same can be said when someone feels that they must continue to be a part of a collective identity despite the unfulfillment of their individual body's demands. So domination tends to produce both these situations and more. Because, because domination ties our capacities to its reproduction, to its reproduction sorry. What I mean by that is that oppressed people, either by being incorporated into complicit collective identities or by asserting their own individual needs above everyone else's, will freely, in the common sense of the word, reinforce patterns that benefit those at the top or recreate domination. So this is something that cements identities for everyone involved, by the way, as it is much harder to even contemplate being something else or breaking free from predetermined ways of relating to others, such as hierarchically. So for those at the top, socialized through all kinds of privilege, so much depends on continuing to be what they are, not only materially, but for their own sense of self-worth, of identity. But for those at the bottom, much importantly, much more importantly, so much might depend on accepting the little one can take and not rocking the boat too much, or on competing with one another to ascend to the top, both requiring conformities of different kinds. Not being able to be someone else due to the analytical conflation of individuals and society that I've described is tantamount to saying that you can't abandon current commitments that are bad, right, that should be abandoned, create new kinds of relationships or change social arrangements. It's really the same, two sides of the same process. Now, this outlook is admittedly not a shared feature within anarchism. Some anarchists do consider that collective identities are inherently anathema to freedom. That's a very well-known fault line in anarchism. Therefore, the emphasis on what the individual body demands varies. But then again, I think it should vary, at least according to context. When we talk about sexuality, for instance, needs and desires are very closely tied to individual bodies. In this case, there is almost no reasonable way to talk about it, if not in defense of individual rights. At any rate, because society is always changing, conditions are always changing, one part of our identity might conflict with another. Some drives that come from individual needs might clash with what may come from other commitments. And there is no way that you can beforehand prescribe a single level of social reality. The individual, the city, the union, right? There's no single level of social reality that should be privileged at all times. Diversity, variety, context, things anarchists have always stressed are key here. So, I think debates within the anarchist tradition, to conclude, revolve around different emphasis on the individual, yeah, but they share a common ground when it comes to freedom. There is more of it in a relationship, the more easily its arrangements can be changed or adjusted to accommodate for new demands and situations. At the same time, this latitude diminishes radically in a relationship with inequalities that constitute domination. Both the oppressor and the oppressed, for different reasons of course, come to reproduce the relationship and even want its reproduction, which makes it harder to change it. Therefore, widening this latitude depends directly on the continuing efforts to safeguard against domination or overthrow it if it's already established. Thinking clearly and independently about what we want when we say we want freedom might give us more confidence as we argue for the social arrangements we think are more conducive and like conducive to, produ to producing and enhancing this freedom. We won't be playing by anyone else's rules anymore if we do that.